legal, it is legal. It is legal to claim asylum. Now, what is very important is that I also want us to be very real about the macroeconomic position that we are in. Let's be very real about this. We have other developed countries like Japan, South Korea, etc. And they have experienced profound economic drawbacks and a demographic crisis because, including stalled growth, because we do not, they do not have a workforce large enough to sustain their elders. And the United States, the only, one of the only reasons that we have been able to have a different fate than that is because we are a country that welcomes immigrants. Because we do not have the capacity right now to pay and continue to pay and fund for Medicare and Social Security and continued economic growth and creating more jobs without immigrants. There's no way to make that math work. And so when we talk about the question of undocumented people, my priority is by opening legal pathways to citizenship and making sure that they are documented. Because this idea of a line and waiting in line, that's not how our immigration system works. And a lot of times that line is 10, 20, 30 years when as many people are, have seen, we have profound labor shortages which can then amount to supply chain issues. And really, the investments that we make as a country, we need to have people and a workforce that can build them. And if we close, quote unquote, close this border, which there's no, I mean, this idea of an open border or closed border is like, this is like a, a Fox News thing. Like the border is a very different construct than how it's presented. And so what's really important to know is that we need our immigrant neighbors. We need them just as much as they need us. And I wanna make that very clear from a macroeconomic perspective. Because when we have parents or when we ourselves are aging and we need people who are our home health care workers, who are our school aides, who are our crosswalkers, without immigrants, they don't exist. Without immigrants, we age alone. Without immigrants, we have no care. Without immigrants, we do not have the support that we need. Because this is New York City. This is who we have always been. Look around this room. Every single one of us comes from somewhere. And we can't just close our eyes and pretend that people who are, who are coming here for new opportunities are any different than the Italian Americans or Irish Americans that came here in 1910 and 1910. I'm not gonna keep you. These are different things. And we need to understand that we are so much more similar than other people would have us believe. Without immigrants, our economy diminishes, if not collapses. And you would be surprised because, you know, and here's, here's where I'm willing to criticize my own team, okay? Because y'all know I have equal opportunity about that. You wanna know one thing about doing things the proper way and whatnot? The Biden administration right now is so far below their refugee and asylee acceptances. We're supposed to be at over 100,000 this year alone. We're under 60. And when we talk about what's happening with Ukraine and Ukrainian refugees given asylum, we have not treated our Afghani brothers and sisters in the same way. We have not treated our, our South American brothers and sisters in the same way. And the United States has contributed historically to regime change in Latin America, which has listed and been part of the multi-decade contributing factors as to why people are on our southern border right now. So we have a lot of work to do, and I agree for our contributions to them. And we also need to understand that this idea that there's a line and doing things the proper way, if we don't want people here undocumented, or some people say illegal. Senator, I've said what I'm going to say about these cases. No one case 
can stand in for a judge's entire record. Okay, but I'm discussing and every one I, of these cases. So if, if you're not going to explain it, Senator, gonna, would you please let her respond? No, not if she's not going to answer my well, question. Well, if you're just going to give a speech, then and, you and, shouldn't and, engage and, in questioning. And you, you are not taking my time. If you want to filibuster, you're, you're welcome to do so, but do I it on your own I would at least time. give you an opportunity to speak, and you should give her an opportunity to respond. If she wants to answer the question, I asked her why please she allow her to answer the I question. asked her why she sentenced Chazen to 28 months when comparable defendants in so her own words answer. were sentenced to substantially higher and she said she's not going to answer did you ha i mean i, I would I, welcome I your I answer please. Please. senator i didn't say i'm not going to answer okay, well, i then said my tell us answer in this facts in this case chazen why did you sentence him to just 28 months senator you're looking at the record i don't have the record here what i will say is that in every case i looked at the recommendations of not only the government but also the probation office the defendant, the record, the evidence, I took into account the seriousness of the offense. And by, by the I way, you ruled. know, one of the striking things in Chazen, the prosecutor comes in front of you and says, this is the prosecutor's argument at this point, and the prosecutor says, I understand from my experience before your honor, your honor's objection, policy objections, to the, to the 2G 2.2 sentencing guidelines. And he goes on to say, However, in this case in particular, the four-point specific offense characteristic is justified because it contains sadomasochistic images of infants and toddlers. I'm trying to understand how you see someone that possesses images of infants and toddlers being sexually violated and you sentence them to 64% below what the prosecutor is asking for. You're, you're, you don't provide a justification other than a generic concern that the guidelines are too high. You don't provide a justification as required by statute. So I'm asking you to take the opportunity to explain to this committee and the American people why in 100% of the cases you have people with vile crimes, and, and you have language saying they're vile crimes, but then you sentence them to very, very low sentences. And, and why do you consistently, 100% of the time, choose to do that? Senator, no one case can stand in for a judge's entire sentencing record. I've sentenced more than 100 people. You have eight or nine cases okay. in that chart. Okay, Judge, you said that before. The, these are the eight or nine child porn cases. I will say to correct the record, I I'm just say about to the judge, there's no point in responding. He's going to interrupt you. Thank Quite you. dismayed at schools that are teaching this to their children, sometimes as young as five. And yet the Department of Justice looked at that issue and decided to label the parents objecting to this teaching as domestic terrorists. Did you participate in discussions about the memo before it was issued? Um, Senator, I can't talk about internal deliberations. You can't talk uh, about whether you, you participated in discussions about the memo? No, but what I can tell you is that the Civil Rights Division will play a role going forward. The Attorney General has uh, uh, asked the department to undertake a review, and the division will participate in that review to determine how federal enforcement tools can be used to prosecute uh, crimes. Do, do, um, do you believe parents objecting to the teaching of critical race theory have civil rights in the democratic process? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't follow the question, Senator. You don't understand the question whether parents objecting to critical race theory have civil rights? The, the First Amendment is a core value in our democracy. And, I didn't um, say free speech. I said civil rights. School board meetings are democratic. They are petitioning your local government. Do they have civil rights that the voting rights gives a damn about? Yet they have the right to express their view, to uh, challenge uh, the school boards, to ask. And, and is it beneficial for the attorney general to label them as d domestic terrorists and direct the FBI to target them? The attorney general's memo deals with threats against public servants and says that threats against public servants are not only illegal, they run counter to our nation's core values. Do you believe parents objecting at school boards are domestic terrorists? I don't, Senator. Do you believe Antifa are domestic terrorists? Um, I, I, I don't have a view about Antifa. Or Do you believe the Black Lives Matter protesters who burned shops, who firebombed police cars, who murdered police officers? Do you believe they're domestic terrorists? 
Um, Senator, I believe that we live in a society where people espouse different views, but what we don't want are threats. You know, Ms. Clark, it is amazing that you're not willing to condemn people who are murdering police officers and firebombing cities because your politics aligns with them. But at the same time, when it comes to parents at school boards, you're perfectly comfortable with calling a mom at a PTA meeting a domestic terrorist. Ms. Clark, with all due respect, this demonstrates why the Democrat proposal to take someone with as long a partisan record as you have and to put you in charge of striking down any voting rights law in the country that you disagree with is nothing but a partisan power grab. Let me, let me give another example, because your division has operated in a purely partisan way. Uh, the Department of Justice dismissed the civil rights lawsuits against the state of New York, the state of Pennsylvania, the state of Michigan for those governor's policies that sent COVID-positive patients into nursing homes, forces, forced the nursing homes to take those patients, a decision, a political decision that resulted in tens of thousands of deaths. One of those governors, Andrew Cuomo, has now resigned in disgrace and his staff had admitted they lied under reporting the deaths that policy caused and yet your division dismissed the lawsuit against those Democratic governors. How are, are we to see that as anything other than a purely partisan decision? The, the letters that uh, were issued to officials in the uh, matters that you referenced were put together by career officials inside the department. Okay. Career officials can't be partisan? This department carries out its work free from political Are, are you testifying to this committee that there are no career officials in the Department of Justice who are partisan? Uh, partisanship does not impact the way that we carry out our Except enforcement Except miraculously, work. you dismiss the lawsuits against Democratic governors, even when their policies may have caused the deaths of tens of thousands of people. You also dismissed a lawsuit uh, that was brought against a medical center that had a pattern of discriminating against health care providers that, for conscience reasons, didn't want to implement abortions, even though clear federal law protects their civil rights. Why did you dismiss that civil rights lawsuit in, in contravention of federal law? Um, General Garland has made clear, and uh, I agree, that partisanship has no place in the enforcement Except every decision of you make Justice is partisan. Department. Your actions contradict those statements. Your time has expired. We're going to